Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started here in a second. So if you'd find your seats or tuck away out of the walkways there. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is the first in our last three lunchtime expedition talks for 2019. Um, just really quickly, if you would, please take your cell phones or electronic devices and mute them and silence them. Inevitably, one or two always go off, and we kind of minimize those distractions. Uh, the support for these programs has been made possible by the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as Sage Creek Ranch. Um, I've mentioned this before, but the quality and the caliber of the speakers that we're able to bring in has only been made possible through the generous support of our partners, and we hope to continue delivering these high-quality content far into the future. These lectures are being recorded, and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you are unable to make any of the lectures in the future or you've missed ones previous to this year, just go to youtube.com, search for Draper Natural History Museum, look for our bear logo, and you'll get all access to our 2018, 2019 lectures, and we will be recording them again in 2020. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Doug Smith. Dr. Smith is a senior wildlife biologist in Yellowstone National Park and responsible for directing the wolf, bird, and elk programs, formerly three jobs that are now combined in under one under his supervision. Originally, Smith began his tenure with Yellowstone as the project leader for the Yellowstone Wolf Project which involved the reintroduction and restoration of wolves to Yellowstone National Park. But Smith has a long history of working with wildlife and in conservation. He received his BS degree in wildlife biology from the University of Idaho in 1985. While working toward this degree, he became involved with the studies of wolves and moose on Isle Royale with Rolf Peterson, which led to long-term involvement from 1979 to 1994 with this study, as well as a master's degree in biology under Peterson at Michigan Technological University in 1988. Smith then moved to the University of Nevada, Reno, where he received his PhD in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology in 1997 under Stephen H. Jenkins. Smith has published a wide variety of journal articles and book chapters on beavers, wolves, and birds, and has co-authored three popular books on wolves, The Wolves of Yellowstone and Decade of the Wolf, which won the 2005 Montana Book Award for Best Book Published in Montana as well as publishing numerous popular articles. The third book, Wolves on the Hunt, came out in May 2016. And his fourth book, Summarizing Wolf Restoration in Yellowstone, is due out in a year. He has participated in numerous of documentaries about wolves for National Geographic and the British Broadcasting Company, or BBC, as well as participating in other media. He has interviewed widely with over 2,000 media interviews to his credit and speaks often about wolves to audiences all over the world. Smith is a member of the Mexican Wolf Recovery Team, the Reintroduction Specialist Group, and the Canid Specialist Group for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. He has studied wolves for 40 years, and besides wolves, birds, elk, and beavers, he is an avid canoeist, preferring to travel mostly in the remote regions of northern Canada with his wife, Christine, and their two sons, Sawyer and Hawken. When it comes to long-standing conservation impact, Few biologists have made such a lasting impression. So please help me and join me in giving Dr. Smith a warm welcome. Hey, you got it. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, sometimes it can be painful to endure listening to people talk about you. So uh, that was very generous of Corey. Um, I also used to just be called a wildlife biologist, but uh, now they call me a senior wildlife biologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it is great to be in Cody country. Uh, I, I seem to come here every year to talk about wolves, a key place to talk about wolves, but I also love to visit because it's got the best selection of horse and gun supplies of any place <laughs> that I go worldwide. Uh, Corey just says I speak worldwide, and if you need horse equipment or guns and shooting equipment, this is the place to come. So, and always the audiences in Cody are enthused about wolves. So I'm really glad to be here and uh, disoriented a little bit, but you know, the park's just right there to the west. You're on the east side. So there's always been a strong relationship and conversation about wolves. Uh, we did, you know, the park was ground zero. Uh, we reintroduced 41 over three years. They spread out. 
uh, across the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so it's, it's always great to be able to talk with you guys about that. You know, things have settled down a lot. Um, the first time I did this, I can't remember how many years ago, but uh, the crowd was bigger. Um, even though it seems like a big crowd now, they're going out the hallways and TVs outside. So I would say uh, Codyites are uh, passionate about wolves. The issue, though, about wolves is we got to live with them. Hence the title of my talk, Wolves in a Modern Age. You know, many people say you work and live in Yellowstone Park, and that's uh, uh, an area of preservation. Our goal is to make it pristine, world's first national park. Uh, and that's true. Um, and the retort is then, you know, you get to uh, the real world, uh, the world where wolves live and people live together, and it can get hard. And that's the the tale of wolves virtually everywhere and for hundreds of years. The initial solution was to kill them off. Uh, you know, we, uh, when we colonized the West, um, we, we took the big game, unregulated hunting. Uh, behind the game came the cattle. With the cattle came the cowboy. With the cowboy came the 30-30 lever action with poison. And the solution to cows without natural game was you got to get rid of the wolves. And so that was pretty much the story of the West um, through 1800s, 1900s. And then because Yellowstone's a park, uh, things started to evolve. Uh, our mission is preservation. Uh, outside the park, the mission's conservation, both worthy missions, they can clash. Um, but we were, you know, we question, and I say we, the American public, the American public through the Endangered Species Act, um, but your voice was heard. We still live, especially Wyoming, in a grassroots civilization. What I view as a grassroots civilization is individual voices matter. And many, many people spoke up saying, how can you have the world's first national park with a mission of preservation of pristineness and not have the top carnivore across North America? So that's when the firestorm begins. Because the old way that I described uh, the 3030 and the poison and the cattle and the cowboy is still entrenched. I mean, that's Cody, Wyoming. That's still here. So how do we make those things mesh? Well, I'll just start with the park. And so I don't know if there's ever an uh, objective analysis of, of this, but if you combine Yellowstone Park, Grand Teton Park, and the National Forest around, I lose track of how many National Forests because they're always getting combined together. But all that public land, a couple national wildlife refuges. Um, this is what some say the most intact temperate zone ecosystem in the world. And that is something we all should be proud of uh, to live here. It's an honor to have that intact, pristine nature, um, mostly pristine here. Um, but it has not always been that way. You know, Yellowstone was established 1872. And this area was a howling wilderness then, no pun intended. Um, and a park in the middle of a howling wilderness is not that, how do I say it, enticing, attractive to people. Because every place they lived, it was a, it was a howling wilderness. So early on, Yellowstone was to be used, to be enjoyed. Um, and in 1916, actually, our mission statement was to preserve for future generations. I won't get this exactly right, but you'll get the gist. Uh, to preserve nature for future generations um, for the enjoyment of the people. And that's kind of on the arch in Gardner that Teddy Roosevelt, you know, he stood in front of it, the famous picture in something like 1904 and, and kicked off the building of that arch. Uh, Teddy was a rare president because he was a, uh, uh, a nature lover, a hunter, a natural historian really involved with Western issues, arguable. We haven't had a president that, like, you know, he, he could identify a golden eagle and a peregrine falcon. We have notes of his in the archives in Yellowstone. That's really remarkable for a president. Um, but anyways, um, it, you know, it was a pleasuring ground, uh, as you can see here. I mean, we would arrest you now in Yellowstone for doing that. Uh, and they built these, these uh, you know, Victorian hotels. They're trying to lure you in with comfort and luxury. And uh, you know now it's different. And now it's about preserving nature, uh, preserving visitor experiences to experience nature. 
And you know, you just can't do that without the top carnivore. Near the end of my talk, I'll talk about the, the importance of wolves to ecosystems, how they structure ecosystems. And before we knew really what they did, we killed them off. You know, and cougars are on the list, bears are on the list, and these things are all kind of part of our food pyramid, the food web, however you want to refer to it. And those top level carnivores um, exert influence down through this, this food pyramid. And, um, you know, humans came along and we tried to replace that function. And in some cases we can do that. And we're hunters and we do okay at that. But we're not on a landscape 24 seven, you know, night and day, year round, far from access points. And so there are subtle differences between having native carnivores and humans. Um, they can coexist together, um, but I think it's good to have a mix, a mosaic of habitats, places like Yellowstone, Grand Teton, maybe Central Idaho Wilderness, uh, Glacier Park, where you know, it's just a mix of large carnivores. And then other places, um, you have humans involved too. So that's the kind of Western mosaic we have that is the goal, but it's, sometimes it's a tough ask because wolves eat the same things that we eat. They need the same things that we need, i.e. space. And so that's where the rub become, comes. So it was a tough sell. It still is a tough sell um, because a lot of people think we did a good job. And so the plan briefly, because I'm talking mostly about Yellowstone, a little bit about Cody, but I learned early on, this is my 25th year on the job, I learned early that uh, when you come outside the park, you shouldn't talk too much about outside the park things because you're a parky. So, you know, s stay in your lane uh, is what people say. But I was part of the recovery effort that was led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so I will give you kind of the big vision and then I'll pull back to the park. But the idea was to restore wolves to the northern Rockies of the U.S., Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. And it was designed to have three recovery areas. The reason why you want to have three, if something goes downhill in one of them, you have the other two to back it up. And so connectivity was key. Those, area, those arrows you see between the recovery areas, very important. We actually lost a lawsuit, the federal government, on lack of demonstrated connectivity. A big deal uh, for wolves in Wyoming is connectivity to the other areas. So we had to demonstrate that with data uh, to get wolves delisted, although wolves ended up being delisted through political action. But nonetheless, we were always working towards uh, the criteria that were put in place for recovery by the recovery team. And wolves reestablish themselves in Northwest Montana through natural dispersal from Canada. Uh, the first wolves were seen in 1979. The first breeding was 1986. That first pack was called the Magic Pack for obvious reasons. They came back on their own. It was magical. Diane Boyd, Bob Ream, University of Montana were heavily involved with that. And the plan was to nurture and protect those wolves. But Central Idaho, Yellowstone ecosystem, there was a big debate that it was maybe too isolated, too remote. And, and the biggest problem for wolves is people. There's no hiding from that. And they'd have to get through kind of an impenetrable dispersal corridor. I'm surprised how many wolves get hit by cars. Wolves get shot by people. And so there was a big debate. Actually, Bob Ream, Diane Boyd were against reintroduction. They said they'll get here on their own. Maybe they would have. It might have taken 50 to 100 years, but they would have done it. Um, but these are important debates. And by the way, that's what makes us move forward is good spirited, but yet intense debates on what should be done. And disagreement is at the center of that. Um, nonetheless, Fish and Wildlife Service, through many years of study, about 20 years of study, decided to do reintroduction. And there were some political reasons behind that as well. That a reintroduced wolf is easier to manage than an endangered wolf, which is the wolves that came into Northwest Montana. And so I'll cut the story short there. Wolves reintroduced Central Idaho, 35, in 1995, 1996. They're thriving. Um, the wolf population estimate right now for Idaho is not that great because they're way above the minimum number required. So the state actually doesn't worry about where their wolf population is because when you're that far above the minimum, 
Why spend time and energy, money to determine it? So Central Idaho has taken off, I'm gonna say 800 to 1,000. And then the GYE, we reintroduced 41 over three years. 1995, 14 from Alberta. 1996, 17 from British Columbia. And 1997, 10 from Northwest Montana, up by Shoto, if you know where that is. Um, I don't have a pointer to point that out. Um, that's okay. Um, right now, as best we can figure out, work with the Wolf uh, team in Wyoming. Ken Mills is the guy I talk to the most. Great guy. Uh, if I disagreed with Ken, which I rarely do, um, it's hard to because he's, he's the nicest guy in the world. I don't think I've ever seen him in person not smiling. And so that's the Wyoming Wolf guy. And we also have similar backgrounds. We, we both worked in our oil. And so, but talking to him this summer, our estimates for the state of Wyoming, you know, uh, Yellowstone this year, I'll get to that, had a good pup crop. We hover around 100. Um, we think the state population is a little bit, you know, between Yellowstone and uh, Wyoming, about 350, 400. That's kind of a preliminary estimate now. I don't know what Ken would say on that, but we had 80 wolves last year in the park. I think we'll be up on that. So that's a quick story for the region. Now I'm gonna drill in a little bit on Yellowstone. And 2020, you know, we have to in life. You'll think this is contrived or, you know, Hollywood uh, made up stuff. But, um, you know, I think touchstones and milestones and symbols are important parts of human life. Next year's the 25th anniversary of Wolf Recovery, so uh, we should be excited. We should have a float in the 4th of July parade. And Cody, wouldn't that be, you know, biggest day of the year in Cody after Christmas or maybe before Christmas, we can have a 25th anniversary uh, horse pack train. Um, but this is, you know, I had this slide in for 10 years and I pulled it out for 10 years and now I put it back in. This is the first wolf going into Wyoming. Uh, Yellowstone, Bruce Babbitt there in the blue, Molly Beatty there in the brown. She sadly passed away a couple years after this photo was taken, but she was the uh, director of the Fish and Wildlife Service at that time, and she endured an incredible amount of uh, political pressure to not do this. Um, and so that's a historic photo. Um, this is what our population's done. I don't have a population estimate right now. Wolves are really hard to count in the summer. Uh, they're kind of uh, spokes on a wheel. The center of the wheel is their den or their rendezvous site, and then they fan out around that, that what we call home site, and uh, they rarely travel together as a pack. So, you know, wolves have two seasons, the summer season of pups, where they're rarely together, really hard to count. I mean, you do a radio tracking flight in an airplane, and if you have four or five wolves collared in a pack, you'll fly to four or five different places to locate them, and you might not see them because they're under a tree, shaded up or something. Winter, they pack up and usually stay together, not always. Great time to get counts. So we don't have counts till winter hits. So this is last year, uh, we had 80 wolves. I think we're gonna be above that because 2017, 2018, we did not have good pup crops. 2017, we had a slight outbreak of distemper. 2018, uh, not quite sure, but it wasn't a great pup year. This year looks good. But you can see the first 10 or 15 years, the population fluctuated quite a bit. We had three disease outbreaks. Twice the population recovered the next year. We call that compensatory reproduction. And then things settled down uh, around 2007, 2008. So what we think happened that first 10, 15 years, there was an overabundance of food in the park. And wolves did really well. And they even overshot their carrying capacity because there was uh, such good food. And then after that third disease outbreak, which was uh, 2008, you can see a decline. They didn't come back. So we felt that there is a new uh, limiting factor to wolf abundance. Um, the population was not regulated by food prior to about 2008. Food was super abundant. And after 2000, and so the disease outbreaks are what kind of dampened the population. And then after 2008, another limiting factor kicked in, and we feel that's food. And I'll elaborate that a little bit. And I'm not gonna take you down into tedious scientific wolf debates, and this will sound like common sense, and to a degree it is, 
But the population dynamics studies of wolves, population dynamics is a study of what makes populations go up and down. And for wolves, it's kind of lagged behind, say, elk or deer. People have modeled and looked at elk deer in much more depth than they have wolves. And that's because some early wolf biologists said, however much food you have is however much wolves you're going to have. And that's kind of true. But remember I said the big problem wolves have is people. So people almost, almost across North America, the leading cause of wolf mortality is humans, almost always greater than 50%. So the majority is human caused. And humans almost always hold them below their natural carrying capacity. So it's really kind of hard to test this hypothesis. But here in the park, you can see this for a game pop or a wildlife population that from that 2008 to 2018 is pretty flat. And so many wildlife populations are fluctuating a lot. And we're, we're pretty flat. And so we feel that we're in equilibrium with the available food. Wolves are at their natural density, unlike many places outside of parks. Um, but as you know, and this is what a lot of people study, is so what causes the population to go up and down after food? And I won't get into that, but usually you study things like uh, reproduction, uh, survival, dispersal, and you look at which one of those factors is most important. And for wolves, that's uh, because of some of these early wolf biologists kind of squelching the debate, uh, we've lagged behind. And then this is the configuration of packs. Wolves are territorial. So that does mean, and there's a debate about this too, people argue about these things. That's good, as I said. But territoriality means self-regulating. Uh, elk and deer, you pack, you have more food, you get more elk and deer in the same amount of space. Same amount of space. More food means elk and deer. And so they will regulate themselves to carrying capacity to the level of what the environment can support. Now, they will probably have big impacts on that environment, but they grew through evolutionary time to have no checks on their reproductive rate. When food is good, you go. Wolves and other territorial species, very different. You cannot squash their territories down. Their territories do fluctuate a lot actually a ton, and it varies a lot based on prey density, but there is a certain minimum size they will not squish down past. Some people call it protected rearing space, and what they mean by that is when you got pups at a den, that pack next door wants to kill them because those pups are soldiers, because wolf territorial battles are huge, and when humans aren't the major mortality factor, other wolves are. And territorial species are like that. They fight with each other for occupation of the landscape. And they will chase you off and kill you. So how do you compete with your neighbor? Raid their den. Kill pups. You lower their pack size. Their pack size is less than yours. You will control more land than they do. So they won't squash down past a certain number. You don't get, you get more food you don't necessarily fill up the landscape because they're constricted by territoriality. Other, as I said, elk, deer, even cougars, bears have home ranges, broadly overlapping areas of use. Territoriality means I'm gonna kick your butt, you come in my territory. Now you can see they overlap and because that's because wolves are just like people. You cheat if you can get away with it. So if the other pack's not around, I'm gonna go across that line and kill that elk. And probably those lines are wavering definitions anyways. But the wolves roughly know where they are because they scent mark, they howl, they patrol, and this is a big deal to them. So the word self-regulation does apply to wolves. Elk and deer, the regulation was predators. And they most are, and this is the big debate about hunting, especially in the far north of Canada, Alaska, even to a degree around here. Predators always hold caribou and moose up there, elk and deer down here, when they occur at their natural densities, below what the food can support. Because these elk and deer are constantly pushing against predators. If we don't have high reproductive rates, we're not gonna have enough of us around because the predators kill so many of us. So that's why you can hunt them and have these surpluses each year, because they evolved with things killing them, holding them below that carrying capacity. That, where that food level that the land can support. You take the predators out, they go right up against that level that food can support, and you get big time environmental damage. 
And some people say that that's what Yellowstone was like when we took the wolves and cougars out and the bear numbers fell. They were never completely eliminated, but the cougars and wolves were gone. And that was the argument for about 30 years, is they were damaging the environment. So, kind of got that out of the way. How do we get wolves back? Um, in this day and age, and there's other biologists here, friends, colleagues, we're not growing much new wildlife habitat in this day and age because the human population is increasing. We need more space, except in Wyoming. It's been right at 500,000 for ever since I came to Yellowstone. Uh, but in general, we're not growing more wildlife habitat. So how do we get wolves back in this mix 25 years ago? In our heads. We control the world. It's a human-dominated world. We got all the cards. We made room for them in our hearts and minds. Change in attitudes. This is the key. Yesterday, I sat for an hour with a new social scientist to Yellowstone talking about what should I do with my new job. And I'm like, oh, geez, it's endless with wolves. We've studied wolves a ton. It's all about people now. How do you deal with wolves and people? Social science. If I was to start my career over, I would probably study wolves again. But the future of wolves is studying people. How, what we do on the landscape, how we think about wolves, how we manage wolves, are all people issues. So what are the problems? <clears throat> I just got back from Minnesota last week talking to a lion expert. And uh, a friend of mine is a tiger expert in India. And both of them made wolves one of the top three most controversial species in the world. Even though lions and tigers eat people, they said wolves have to be top three. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, because normal Africans and normal Indians can't pick up the phone and call a US senator and call in an airstrike the next day. That's what they do with wolves in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho. And no Indian or African can do that. And they just drug someone out of their hut from their bed and ate them back by the white outhouse because the husband found his wife there in the middle of the night in two. And you know what he did? He put rat poison on his wife because that kills the lion. And this guy last week is saying wolves need to be top three. That's how big of a deal they are. Two... They compete with us on everything we want. Space, livestock, big game hunting. I mean, for Codyites, those are the big three in life, right? Now, they rarely kill livestock, but that's a black and white issue. When they do, they get killed. Livestock killing wolves are not tolerated. But big game hunting, no one said they weren't going to eat elk and deer. Uh, occasionally moose. Uh, and Yellowstone, occasionally bison, but their main prey are elk and deer. Um, and so that's always an open question. And unfortunately, the things I said to you were generalizations. Almost every system has a different answer. A close friend and colleague of mine studied wolves for 18 years in the Yukon Territory, and they did a massive wolf-killing campaign. They killed over 800 wolves and radio collared over 350 to find out, does killing wolves give you more moose and caribou and doll sheep across the entire territory? The Yukon Territory is right next to Alaska. And you know what he said? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Southwestern Yukon, Pacific Ocean influence, lots of snow. Killing wolves did nothing. The limiting factor was snow for those moose down there. Killing wolves didn't do a thing. So it's really frustrating to hunters, and I've heard a lot of frustrated hunters, that sometimes wolves make a difference and sometimes they don't. Usually alone, though, when you only got wolves, they don't. It's usually wolves in concert with bears, cougars, and human hunters, and then you start getting elk populations below objective, as determined by state game managers, or depressed. Um, Alaska, similar situation. In all state land, you probably all know this, predator control is required by law, so they're killing wolves and bears on state land to grow more moose and caribou because of this predator effect. But it only, it's only happens in some places. Human safety, don't, oh, I gotta get going. Um, overblown, wolves aren't dangerous. Will, have they attacked people? Yes. 
Have they killed people? Yes, two in the last 100 years. Um, it can happen, but you know, I walk around Mammoth, which is park headquarters, and I'm more worried about cow elk chasing me during the calving season. And you know, I walk right up to wolf kills and chase wolves off them. I pull pups out of dens. Um, I treat wolves like I treat other wildlife. You be careful around them. You know, it's just, that's the way it is. And uh, there are th many of the things you do for bear safety are the same for wolf safety, but that's overblown. You know, people building, you know, wolf proofs, uh, wolf proofs uh, sheds at bus stops for kids is just, you know, drama, hyperbole. Um, they're, they're not dangerous. Uh, the key for us here is what I talked about in a previous slide, is how you think about wolves. What are your values? And the issue with that is how you were brought up, your parents, your friends, your cultural influences, probably before your age 10, sets you on your trajectory for your life. So if you think the world is here for us to use as we please, then you're probably going to say, this was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, bringing wolves back to, to Wyoming. If you have a worldview, which is you're just one species among many, and you're here to coexist, you're going to think this is a great idea. And it's about dadgum time we corrected a long-standing wrong, which we did in the late 1800s, early 1920s. And there ain't no change in your mind. I mean, I've been in Yellowstone 25 years, studying wolves for 40, and for probably 30 of those years, I thought if just people had all the information, all the data, they would see the light. They would get that wolves aren't that bad, that they could be managed like other wildlife. Was I ever wrong? I'm not going to change your guys' minds. I might be able to talk to you a little bit. And I'm not sure even compromise would be the word we want to do. Because compromise, some people say that's a loss for everybody. But this is the social science I'm talking about. How do you move forward with those kinds of thoughts? So, science. That is the arbitrator that we like to fall back. I say we, state game departments, national parks, universities, uh, you know, federal research agencies. But when you grow up in a value system where how you see the world is what you know about the world. Does science even matter? I mean, I, I don't know. And the other thing is, as I said 10 minutes ago, we rule the world. Nature always loses the economics. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard, and colleagues of mine who work in Africa and India, I'm just trying to feed my family. That's all I'm trying to do. That will always win. When you got wolves in the landscape killing livestock, or even kill an elk. I'm just trying to make a living. That always loses to economics. So, you know, these are, these are sticky problems. And I'm not offering solutions, I'm just presenting them to you. Um, how you think typically has nothing to do with facts and reality. We are perceive the world as it's told to us. And, what, and, and the story that we come up with. And that has been proven I'm falling back on science a little bit here, to be the way people took over the world. They don't even necessarily have to have the right story about reality. But what you need to be able to do, some say we conquered the world because of our sociality. By telling other people's stories, and they believe it, and we organize and cooperate, and then go forth onto the landscape and conquer the world. And there have been several studies to say that's how it's done. So wolves get chewed up in that myth-making factory. Because, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I get asked the question, how long are you going to do this? Don't you know where they go by now? If we stop studying wolves, and I'm talking about the state of Wyoming, the U.S. National Park Service, the state of Idaho, uh, the state of Montana, people will make up the story about them. I've been riding these mountains my whole life, dead gum, and I know exactly what those wolves are doing. Yeah, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. So, for the wolves, the story is rarely true, I have found. The other interesting thing is, if you think fish stories are big, 
I told someone one time a story that I saw flying around an airplane that a wolf did something, and I told it to one person. And that person told it to someone else. And then a few weeks later, that someone else came up to me and said, hey, my friend saw the coolest thing. And this wolf went on to do blah, 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 blah. And as the story went on, I was like, I think this is my story. <laughs> and I could only get bits and pieces out of it that actually were true. And it only went, well, I said, who told this to you? Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I'm like, ah, the light bulb went on. This is my story. And it's only gone through two people, and it's already changed. And, you know, historians say that oral history is always different than written history because of that reason. We add our juice to every story. I know I do. I mean, as the years go by, I like making my story sound better. I mean, what the heck is storytelling all about? That's my point about wolves. You've got to be careful. And, in fact, Dave Meach, the leading wolf biologist in the world, I was with him last week in Minnesota, told me, 82 years old, he's been studying wolves since 1958, so when I'm in his office, I'm usually just like this. He said, I almost don't believe anything about wolves unless I see it for myself. Because the stories are so big. And a big one is how they kill. So I don't know how many kills I've seen. Um, this is one I saw this April. I'm going to spare you, because sometimes I worry about showing wolves killing to a crowd from Cody, like what the stories are going to be after you guys leave this room. But I'm flying overhead in a super cub, and these wolves, and this is April, so the, the elk, it's a calf, an elk calf. That is a big target for wolves because they're more vulnerable, especially in April. And saw so this pack of wolves take down this uh, elk calf. And people love to spin yarns about this. Maybe the number one wolf yarn. They kill for the fun of it. They are bloodthirsty killers. They kill the healthy this, you know, the old, the sick, and the weak thing is an old fairy tale. This is what people, and you know, you go through country that's got wolves in it, and you don't see any elk or deer, you don't hear any bugling, you don't see any tracks. Um, so this is big fodder for stories. So I do like to go in the mountains. This is actually an outfitter camp in Shoshone National Forest. Um, I was riding two, two weeks ago, maybe three, I lose a guy in uh, Gallup National Forest, Absorca Beartooth Wilderness with actually a guy from Cody, uh, he was with us, with the intent to talk to outfitters. His horse threw a shoe, we weren't able to do all that, but I've talked to those outfitters before because in general, those guys do not like wolves. Ran into seven of his hunters, four of them had already gotten elk, season was only four or five days old, but we gotta talk, we gotta talk. This is that values thing I'm talking about. We're not gonna do it, and this is an old, Yellowstone Park Ranger told me this around 2000. Old, old guy, I really looked up to him. Unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. Doug, no one cares about your science. No one cares about your journal articles. No one cares about your TV shows. No one cares about your radio interviews. These guys care if you show up. You got that? They ride around the mountains with 30 out sixes or seven millimeter max. Those are the guys who care. Get on your horse and get going. So even though I have become more of a bureaucrat over the years, and I'm sad for that, that's important. And I still try and do it. <clears throat> How do we solve this? I don't know, actually. Uh, but like how you solve all the other problems in your life. You know, talking to a big group like this, you guys can decide for yourself if you're going to believe anything I say. I talk to you looking you straight in the eye. I have a little bit better chance of changing your mind. And actually, I don't even know if I want to change your mind. I just want you to hear me. Hear me out. Um, and you've got to understand human nature, which is, you know, we're all selfish. We're all self-serving. And we come up with our old, own stories about how the world works. If you don't, you go crazy. You have to make sense of this stuff. So I'm not going to try and win you over with wolves are great and they will carry the day. But we got to talk about it. And we got to exchange these philosophies and values. So that's why I meet with the opposition. 
And outfitters aren't the opposition. I didn't mean to frame. I make these slides in a hurry sometimes. I apologize for that. And everything in life is small steps. I think we all do well at the big things, you know, the big things in life. It's the teeny things, the chit chat, the, in, the time in between the big things that are hard. That's wolves. That's the social science we're trying to do. So what? We got to talk about elk because everybody in Cody's a hunter, um, right? Um, this is the Northern Yellowstone elk herd since 1960. Now, the Northern Yellowstone elk herd was regulated by the Park Service from roughly 1923 to 1968. When we took all the predators out, what do you think happens? I already talked about this. The elk go to the level that the food supports. So if you read any books and park records from the middle of the 20th century, all the talk is about the elk damage that they're doing to the vegetation, to the soil, out competing other wildlife, we gotta do something. So they removed, and I've looked at a few different sources of this, and I can't pin down the exact number, but roughly 80,000 elk from 1923 to 1968. They either killed them, shipped them, and they shipped them to like over 20 states. Wyoming did this too, outside the park. Because remember I talked about the market hunting? Well, Northwest Wyoming, in and out of the park, still had elk. And so they shipped them all over. Wyoming Game and Fish magazine, Wyoming Wildlife, had an article on this about a year ago. Map of Wyoming showing where all the elk went out. They went to Canada as well, all over. They were taking elk. Uh, or the Park Service killed them, or Montana hunters killed them at the park line. Some call it a firing line when the elk came out of the park in the winter. And that kept the elk herd down. You can see the late, and it stopped in the 1960s because of public outcry, your voice matters, and because the Park Service changed their philosophy towards one that's called natural regulation. That's that limiting stuff I was talking about. And with predators, natural regulation means they're going to hold elk down to a level below what food can support, and when you don't have predators, the elk will rise up to level food can support, and almost all the university professors during this area said the elk population's overpopulated. And so did the states, too, by the way. You got to cut them down, and you got to cut them down by hunting. So that was when the, the elk population bulged. That's that middle period of the graph. And then we released wolves, and everybody forgets about this. And then cougars came back on their own. <laughs> And everybody forgets about this too. And then bears came back, they increased. They were always there. And we got a bear expert in the room in the back. They were always there, but they increased too. And so that surge in predators and the state of Montana still trying to reduce the elk population by killing 1,000 cows per year. And in a hard winter, it would go over 2,000. All those things together conspired to take the population down to where it is now, lower. And so folks from Cody, this is my toughest graph I will show you. Because the American public, probably a lot of you, are all about how can those tall bars, which are pushing 20,000 elk in this one herd, not be better than way down here? Now you're looking at, and this is counted elk, by the way, and if we do sightability adjustments, it's probably 30% more, but how are those tall bars not better than those short bars? Tell me that. Americans are built on consumerism. We're built on more is better. I hear this all the time. You're calling, the National Park Service is calling this a success story? Are you kidding me? You cut the elk herd by 60%. It's them damn wolves. That's what did it. And I paid for them damn wolves. That's what I hear all the time. I still hear this. In nature, more is not necessarily better. We flip it to, and this can be true about our lives, our interpersonal relationships, sometimes less is more. That's the message here, at least in ecosystems. It's not an economy built on consumerism. Um, I'm running out of time. This is, the, you know, Mark Twain, my favorite writer, or one of, you know, he said, you can make statistics say anything you want. The last two graphs are not statistics. There's nothing statistical about them. 
This is just plotting on the bottom axis how many elk we had in that northern herd against how many wolves. And all this is showing is the line is erratic all over the place. And the last few years, it's starting, those green lines, it's starting to settle down, become less erratic and more stable. And that's kind of a hallmark of an intact ecosystem. Now that's probably a temporary state because the other hallmark of ecosystems is whatever you see now is just one state onto the next state. They're in constant flux. But we just went through a period of about 100 years of flux. No predators, artificial control, carnivores came back on their own. We're in a brief blip of stability now. And these are stopping points along the trajectory of nature. <clears throat> so we're studying the elk now too, because they are the gods. You know that in Wyoming, they are the gods, the iconic wildlife. Okay, and so we gotta know what they're doing to the elk. So we keep roughly 100 female elk collared uh, at all times in the northern herd. Other researchers in Wyoming, they'll catch elk in the park. The Jackson office catches elk on two ocean plateau. There used to be a study at University of Montana, the Madison fire hole, but I won't go through all the elk studies, but they're, the, they're kind of in a lot of ways the pulse of the landscape. And it's those cows, not so much the bulls, that are telling you what, what the trajectory of the herd is doing and why they're, they're, there's problems or there's not problems. And I'm really losing time and this next graph is hard to explain, and I threw it in because I love talking to folks from Cody because you're so passionate about wildlife. But this is hard to explain, but I'll do it very quickly. The yellow bars are the age distribution of the elk based on what we catch, live elk. The gray bars is the distribution of the ages of what wolves kill. So they are selecting the older elk. And those are the least productive members of the herd. In fact, we know they don't have a calf every year because it takes a lot of energy to have a calf and restore your body condition to, it's gotta be above 12% body fat, better to be 16 to 18 to 20% body fat, but you gotta have a certain minimum condition to be able to conceive and gestate a calf the next winter. And you gotta do that in the summer. And it's really hard to do when you got a baby because she's going to be nursing all summer, pulling energy out. And you got to put enough energy in to overcome that and get your body fat up at those levels. And if you don't do it, you go into alternate year reproduction, and that kicks in around 12 or 13. And that's the wolf, those are the elk wolves you're killing. So they're killing the least productive members of the herd. And the thing I love to do every year is every wolf kill we get, we pull an incisor, we look at the age of it, and the thing that's flat is the average age of a cow elk killed by wolves. Almost every year the average is 14. And this alternate year reproduction hits around 12. And so that's where the black line is. That's that pregnancy rate. It's falling off after 12. Why? Because of what I just said, alternate year reproduction. And that pink line is survival. It starts falling off around there too. And it varies by herd. It varies by herd what that inflection point is. But for the northern herd, that's it. So, and this is what the folks in the bar really get mad at me about. Oh, they kill any elk they want. Healthy, vulnerable, it's all of them. Elk from two to about that 12 age, look at that survival cur her or curve. They ain't dying. Those are prime age elk and they're almost, almost invulnerable to wolf attack. And they're the ones that are most productive. And I worked in our oil, as Corey said, for 15 years. And moose are harder to kill than elk for obvious reasons and bison or buffalo are harder to kill than moose for obvious reasons. And this Teflon protection against wolves is even greater for moose, having worked with that data set as well. When they get to about two, they gotta get through those younger years because they are vulnerable and they're young, but when they hit the two or so, wolves ain't gonna kill them pretty much until they get to about 13, 14. I mean, it makes sense. The average wolf weighs 100, 110. A big wolf's going to weigh 130. Um, and you're a cow elk that weighs 500. And you're a bull that weighs 750. You're a moose that weighs 1,200. And they're in the prime of life, and a wolf's going to walk up to them and kill them with their teeth. Sure. 
believe that story if you want. So, and then there's more to it than that. I just threw this in. That's just the beginning of life and death in Yellowstone in Wyoming. Uh, there's a photo I took last fall from the airplane, Junction Pack, Jasper Bench. You all half have probably been there. Um, but rarely, oh, I just found my pointer. Um, um, you rarely get a grizzly and wolves right next to the kill. I got, I got a phone call this morning. I didn't think I was going to make it here on time. Guy, a guy's at Old Faithful, Doug, I just saw a bear kill an elk, and six wolves take it from him, and the wolves drag it across the Firehole River. And I'm trying to get out the door on my way here, and I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what kind of bear? I don't know. Had to have been a black bear because grizzlies don't really give up um, carcasses to wolves very well. And then they drug it across the river, so it had to have been a calf. But anyways, that was what, one reason I almost was late. So I have to quote Mark Twain again because now we're at a point that I want to, like, everything I've said comes to a head. The stories, the making up, the upbringing, your worldviews. He summarized it. And what I've struggled with my whole career is how do you say this stuff in an hour to folks who come and learn about wolves and not make it so it's boring or they forget about it? Mark Twain did it in one sentence. Supposing is good. That's what we do. That's the storytelling. That's the growing up with your folks and friends and cultures. We suppose that our whole life. Finding out is better. That's science. That's science. We need to have those things intercept more. Rather than just, I've been riding these mountains my whole life, I know what's going on. We need to compare that to some objective measures as well. So I'm, about, I'm making phone calls now. This is, we do, I'm, I've, we're talking about studying elk. I put them in first, because remember, in Wyoming, they're the gods. Um, we gotta study wolves, because they're the ones competing with us for the elk. We dart them. Uh, Wyoming does that too. Ken Mills, already mentioned him. Ron Blanchard's back here. He works with Ken. And then we get your hands on them. Their story's in their teeth. You know, that's all they got. A cougar has, I don't know what the technical terms are, but they can go like this with their legs. Wolves just go like this. And wolves, the claws are always out, so they get worn down. Cougars, they kind of go out and in, so they're always sharp. So retractable, thank you. Um, so cougars actually have higher per capita kill rates than do wolves. And if you ever have studied a mama cougar with three kittens, you should see the kill rates. They make wolves look like lousy killers. Um, but the story for wolves usually is teeth. We just had a paper come out a couple weeks ago on tooth breakage in wolves in Yellowstone, Isle Royale, and Scandinavia. We looked at skulls across those three study areas, and they correlate nicely with prey availability. When prey becomes scarce, tooth breakage goes up. And when prey is abundant, tooth breakage goes down. Seems obvious, but with science, you gotta, you gotta prove it. Um, and then after we catch them, we fly them. And that's me and Roger Stradley. Unfortunately, he had to retire after, uh, a couple years ago. He started flying in 1960. Uh, that was the year I was born. Um, and he, he, he had to retire a couple years ago at 78. And I spent thousands of hours in the back of that plane with that guy, I kind of miss him. But I had to put that photo in out of remembrance of Roger. But uh, I've already talked about this, and I do have a video showing how we catch wolves. Most people like that, so I'm gonna pick up the space here. I've, I've kind of already talked about this. You know, we can have the biological carrying capacity, that's what the land can support, and then we can have the social carrying capacity. And for wildlife outside of parks, that's almost always the level that wildlife populations occur at, is the social carrying capacity. And so, a, a, you know, big debate about hunting. Um, I think every state biologist I've ever talked to have said that to have wolves, you need to hunt them. Uh, and, and why is that? You know, because a lot of people say to me who are very pro-wolf, they're self-regulating. Doug, you say it in your lectures. That's true, but, um, and so why do we hunt them? We don't need to hunt them, and you don't eat them. Um, and very few people, you know, you, you hunt them for their pelt, you hunt them for a trophy mount, you hunt them for the sport of hunting. Um, 
But I would say the debate is most people say, you know, they're sharing space with us, they're killing elk with us, they're killing deer with us. Um, uh, tolerance is what you get from hunting them. Is, and you've got a problem with livestock. Uh, you're, you perceive them, and it may be right, it may be true, or it may not be. I've got fewer elk in my favorite hunting area, and it's because of wolves. And so if you can kill a wolf, you feel better. You feel better. Social acceptance, tolerance. There are some social, uh, uh, social scientists, most of these are academics, university types, who go, there's no truth to that at all. Wolf hatred trumps everything. Scandinavia, they are looking at total wolf mortality based on you make wolves hard to kill, po poaching goes up. And then, because you're, you're keeping your hunting level down here. You raise your hunting level up, poaching goes down. And there's ways, there's statistical ways to estimate something you don't know. Because poachers ain't going to tell you how many wolves they kill a year. But they're estimating that, and they're looking at total wolf mortality based on hunting regulations. So this is a minor big deal, and I don't have a lot of time to get into it. But most game managers are going to say, we can't have wolves unless we have hunting. Because it enhances tolerance. And then there's, a, there's some people dissenting. And for me, in Yellowstone, this is an issue. It is the best place in the world to see free-ranging wolves. So we have people coming from all over the world, all times of the year, especially during shoulder seasons to see wolves, and they're passionate about them. And they get very upset when their favorite wolf gets shot outside the park. And they're like, one person benefited from that wolf. And when it's living inside the park, thousands benefit. What are you going to do? numerous phone calls like that every time it happens. Every time it happens. So I don't know. And I don't know. So, and that, that economic activity leads to $35 million a year of people visiting uh, Yellowstone through gateway communities like Cody coming to Yellowstone. See, I hear a lot of people come to Cody on their way to Yellowstone. Um, and so this has important implications. So overwhelming national support and even kind of a debate in the states that are dealing with wolves. And, and I'm running out of time, and so I don't have time to get into this. I'm going to blast through these slides. But to address this issue of hunting, we started a study with three other national parks. I already mentioned that wolf hunting in Alaska is a big deal. And so we have been, for the last 10 years, studying what are the impacts of wolf hunting outside of national parks. The national parks of interest are Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Denali, uh, and Yukon Charlie in Alaska. Uh, and each park has a different kind of uh, uh, wolves. Uh, Yellowstone, they live in the park 95% of the time. Grand Teton, they don't. It's about 50-50. Denali, there's a thin sliver where they cross between in and out of the park. It used to be close to hunting and trapping. It's not now. And then Yukon Charlie, there's wolf control all around the park. Wolf control is not hunting. Wolf control is when you're trying to kill 80 to 90% of the wolf population to grow moose or caribou. And so we've got a mix of influences outside the park, and we want to understand what's going on, what are the impacts on that, on our mission, our policy inside the park. And so this is, uh, these are the data thus far. You can see very few wolves killed in Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming worked very hard to have small wolf hunting units with a quota right out of the gate. Montana and Idaho did not do that right out of the gate. So there are more discussions with Montana and Idaho. But the other thing that Wyoming's got is most of the border with Yellowstone is wilderness. There are very few people, I mean, there's, there's hunting on the borders, outfitters, wilderness hunters. Um, but the Gardner Basin is there's a town <laughs> of Gardner. That's why the wolves in Gardner Basin to the north are, are much greater number killed because it's a human access thing. This is a wolf that got shot last year in Wyoming. She just died. A couple guys are out trying, or a guy and a gal are out trying to get her right now, upper Malomar River. But this is a wolf that was part of Molly's pack uh, that got shot legally in Wyoming, got wounded on the hunt, went back in the park, and limped around for a year on three legs. Uh, so there's wounding loss to wolves like there is to elk and deer during the hunting season. This is Denali. They, their data goes back to the mid-'80s. The problem with their data is we want to understand social impacts, probably numerically, in Yellowstone Grand Teton, maybe not Denali or Yukon Charlie, 
but the numeric impacts on the population are probably nil. But social impacts could be significant. And so we need to know pack size, we need to know pack composition, and for the most part in Denali, they don't know it. So the little money we've got to do the study has been going towards trying to determine in places like Yukon Charlie and Denali what pack size and composition is. And this is one way to do it. These are remote cameras of wolves in Denali National Park. So they bought some cameras to just get pictures of the packs. So sorry, and I am, I don't want to keep you too much longer. So th this is our tension. These are both worthy mandates determined by people, preservation, no use, conservation, wise use. Both great, but they clash right at the boundary. So we got to work through that. Um, I, I can't say much about politics, but wolves have always been a bipartisan issue. This, I'm not going to go through this. This is, a, this is a list of Republicans and Democrats who made wolf recovery happen in the tri-state area. So this doesn't have to be the polarized issue that historically has been. And, you know, Yellowstone is a huge conservation theater. Huge. Everything's a big deal. Add wolves to that, and it's even bigger. And as I mentioned, the economic study done at the University of Montana showed that wolf viewing in Yellowstone leads to $35 million a year. Quickly, I have to talk about this food web trophic cascade debate. Too many elk led to too much eating of the willow and aspen. This is a recent look at Upper Cache Creek with the, the aspen coming back. And that's been the biggest scientific debate after a century of woody vegetation suppression. Why are you getting it coming back? So this was not a public debate. This was a scientific debate. It led to an increase in beavers. I actually do beaver surveys in Yellowstone too. I'm gonna to start that survey Tuesday. But there's been an increase in beavers and the science could, scientists are just like everybody else. They love to disagree and argue. Plus, you don't get to be a famous scientist by agreeing with everybody else. If you're the outlier, you get in the newspaper more because you're that lone voice that's saying, no way. And what we can do, and we've got a book coming out, hopefully in less than a year, and one of the things I tried to do in the book was I had these disparate researchers who don't get along. I said to them, you're going to have to write together on one chapter. And I cannot tell you how many times they went, oh, no, 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 no. We each want our own chapter. And then after I made them work on one chapter together, they said, I can't work with him. So I want my little essay in the middle of the chapter with just my name on it so I can say what I want to say. And this went on for like three or four years. It's like, no, you guys got to have some type of resolution so we can move forward. And one way we came up with that is there's probable multiple limiting factors that operate in a tiered fashion. And the first one was probably elk as I've been saying throughout my whole talk. There were probably so many elk in Yellowstone, they were browsing down every stem of willow and aspen. Cottonwood's a little bit of a different story, I'll leave that out. Once the elk browsing was alleviated, the next limiting factor kicked in, and that was probably moisture. In other words, some of these folks did experiments by fencing out elk, and sites where you reduced elk browsing, but did not have adequate moisture, you did not get much recovery of willow and aspen. But in sites where you reduced browsing and had adequate moisture, you got a big response. And then the stands became decadent. Decadent, because nothing was eating them. And these plants evolved to have some pruning. And so where you got the best conditions was moderate browsing with adequate moisture. So elk are part of the equation, but not an overwhelming part of the equation. I found that to be very, very interesting. And the other key finding that they could not agree on was this is a heterogeneous response, which means not every place in northern Yellowstone did willow and aspen cover, recover. It wasn't homogeneous. It was heterogeneous. These are small things. But remember I said the hardest part of life are small things? We all love to hold on to our little teeny idea, and that's what we hang our hat on. And scientists do the exact same thing. So when you all buy the book, I'm not making any money on it, by the way, um, so I can push it as a government employee. You can read this chapter. It's chapter 16 and see if that came across. So I got to finish, and I want to show you just five minutes of footage, and I'll go very quickly. 
But if there's anything I want to summarize my talk on is this. My whole career, I've done just this. I've tried to put a number on everything. But I'm going to guess most of you don't care about the numbers. What you guys want is a story. So last winter, I got laid off for five weeks. Government shutdown. I'm out of work. I wasn't even getting paid. So I wrote an essay for the Washington Post on a famous wolf, 9-11. Uh, he, he rose to the a leader of a pack. He had two litters of pups. One of them died. His mate died. I'm telling this quickly, you can read the article. Just Google 9-11 Washington Post or Wolf 9-11. Um, and then he started to go downhill, downhill. And we didn't know why. That whole summer in April it started, just whoosh, downward slide. Then in September, and that's the Worst time of year to be a wolf. Right now is the worst time of year to be a wolf. Why? Because the elk and deer are in great shape. Summer range, put them in their best condition of the year. And remember I talked about wolves taking vulnerable elk is the best. There's hardly any vulnerable elk right now. And there's a lot of indicators I could use to show you that. He killed this elk on his own. Boom, killed it. Within 60 minutes, another pack came in and killed him. Boom. And then we, we knee crops, you know, and saw his jaw split in two. Likely what happened is he got kicked by a bison or elk in April, lived the rest of the summer out, and then on the last day of his life, he killed an elk for his pack. They just didn't get there in time. Can you believe that? Could you imagine the pain he was in, walking around for four months? I think my life sucks sometimes. <laughs> and I, don't even, I walk around, if I had a broken jaw, I would get it fixed right away. And he walked around with nothing. So you can read the story there. By the way, my colleague from the Yukon called me up after the story came out, and he says, forget about your book. An essay like this in a national paper does far more to help wolves than a ticky-tacky technical book on wolves. Thanks, Bob, for the <laughs> blunt news. I was flying, we, a New York Times did a story on Yellowstone wolves a couple years ago, and I'm flying, and I get a mort signal. I look down, I see a dead wolf. I, I call uh, my crew, or I text my crew with a phone in the plane. They had just one day, the New York Times sends a photographer for one day. It happened to be this day. So I said, take the photographer in. Show him this dead wolf. This is the alpha female, the eight mile pack, dead. Probably killed by elk and uh, bison again. She's pregnant. So whole litter pups, I think they had six in her, gone. This is how the world works, folks. I really, I mean, it's, it's tough. Um, this, I, I deal a lot with people saying these are super wolves. Uh, you went to Canada. That was not the wolf that lived here, Canis lupus eremotus. I won't get into, and eremotus is no longer a subspecies. Uh, but these wolves are not the wolves that belong here. Uh, the wolves that came here are bigger. And they're therefore, you know, wiping out our elk that are smaller and not, you know, not proper for these wolves. So this, these two wolves, this is the, uh, the Delta pack. Uh, one reason I picked this slide yesterday going through this talk is they, they're the closest wolves to here. Uh, they live in the southeast corner of the park, at least in Yellowstone, at least in Yellowstone. And I caught these wolves, darted them, and their brothers, the black wolf was 660 when he weighed 117, 760 weighed 116. The next year... By mistake, this happens. Another gray wolf in the pack had a collar that wasn't working, and I was flying up Mountain Creek, and I wanted to get that wolf, and I darted 760 again by mistake. And this is, so one year, he went from 116 to 148. And that is the single biggest wolf we have caught in Yellowstone, and he had a fully empty belly, because they can hold up to 22 pounds of meat in their stomach. And he was, a lot of times, a drug. This isn't bad, and I don't mean to be crude, but they'll puke up bile. He was puking bile. No meat in his stomach. If they had meat in their stomach, chunks of meat are coming out. Nothing's coming out but bile. That was a true 148. Biggest wolf we've caught out of 600 captures. I have people tell me all the time, I saw a wolf the other day in the Absorca Mountains that was 180. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, we fly around the park in a helicopter with a scale in our hands, and that's the biggest wolf. Last story, and then I'll go, sorry, 
tell it quick. This is 755. Uh, he used to be the alpha male of the Lamar Canyon pack. Um, his mate, um, 832, the 06 female, uh, got shot in 2012. Um, he dispersed from the pack because the next ranking female up was his daughter. Um, wolves avoid inbreeding. Uh, he paired with another female in Lamar Valley. She got killed by another pack. He paired with a third female. Um, and they were together for, I forget, Rick McIntyre would know exactly, but they split up. And I remember going up to Rick McIntyre going, you know, I think wolves aren't like people. A lot of times they are, but they're not. And I'm, I thought male meets female, it's going to lead to a new pack. And I said, Rick, why do you think they split up? And Rick does his normal thing. I don't know if you know Rick, but he goes, uh, Doug, I don't know if you know this, but uh, she was quite a bit younger than him. <laughs> Who hasn't heard that story? Old guy dates young female, and she leaves him. So get that one. He pairs a fourth time with another female in Hayden Valley, has two litters with her, and you're thinking, finally, in Wolf World, there is a happy ending. Well, then Molly's pack, three males move over and take over the pack. Move him out, literally move into the rendezvous site, start caring for his pups. He can't get to them. What is his mate thinking? It's a cruel world out there, guys. Anything happens to us, she moves on right away. But he leaves. Collar goes out, disappears somewhere out here east of the park. We don't know the end of the story. So these stories that these wolves have is a big part of what we're trying to do in Yellowstone. Population biology is about means and variances and trends. The population as a whole. We're trying to, back, we're trying to do that. We are. But we're backing up and telling individual stories when we can because that makes a richer understanding. And so I'll finish by saying to Cody Country folks, this is a remote camera in the middle of Yellowstone. Two wolves from Maui Pack. Take out the wolves. What does that country mean to you? Same camera. That's not the sun, that's a moon. Lower right, there's a wolf. Same question. You live in Wyoming, one of the greatest states in the country because of its wildlands and its wildlife. Take that wolf out in the lower right. What does this mean to you? Some call wolves a symbol of wilderness, others call it the grizzly, others call it the common loon. It's all nature. And you take something out, it's not the same. And so maybe all those years of giving talks and trying to put a number on something, I was wrong when Adolph Murray, a Wyoming out, he lives south of Grand Teton every summer, went to Alaska, Denali Park, every, excuse me, every winter he lives south of Grand Teton, Every summer he went to Denali. This was the frontest piece of the first wolf monograph ever written, The Wolves of Mount McKinley, now it's called Denali. And maybe he knew then that stories are important. This is Robert's service. The mountains are a part of me. I am fellow to the trees. He was the poet of the far north, primarily Yukon territory. I think that's relevant to Wyoming. Think about it. Uh, I just have five minutes of footage. I'm, I apologize for going over. I know you'll never invite me back again, <laughs> so it's okay. This is, this is the thoroughfare that I was talking about. Um, a wolf darting was invented in Alaska. And when you get wolves like this, you can see why it was, it's invented. Um, you're going to see some footage coming up when it is not like that. But that was ideal darting conditions. Deep snow, you slide in behind them with a helicopter, and you put a dart in them. Very good for everybody. That's Dan Staler. I work with him uh, in Yellowstone. Have been since 97. Having low turnover in your crew is good. So this is Carol Fair again. This is, this is ideal darting. You're going to see non-ideal darting in a couple of years. Wolf got hit by a really dark. The guy who uh, flies is from Wyoming. His name's Bobby Hawkins. He's from Grable, Sky Aviation out of Worland.
check to make sure they're fully sedated before you get there. Cover their eyes because it's blowing snow. Sometimes the drug makes them so they can't blink. This is, you can hear Roger and Bob talking. This wolf was stuck on the top of a mountain where there wasn't much snow. And she didn't want to leave it because she had good footing where there wasn't much snow. And I actually missed her the first shot. And she wouldn't leave this area because she knew if she got in the deep snow, her mobility would be cut back. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. I have a camera on my helmet. Do you want to get her? I, I got a dart in my hand. Yeah. Oh, you want to wait and see? So I put the dart in at the last yeah, second because yeah, if it's cold, the drug will, yeah, okay. will get right, syrupy and not unload or eject from the dart very well. So you want to keep it warm to the last second. I'm in. I'm loaded. So helicopter pilots have ice water in their veins. You heard him talking. I was really excited. He was. I, uh, shit, I think I, yeah, I was talking over my I don't think she language dark. because I missed. And you'll hear him. This is him agitated. Listen. Okay, uh, she's going downhill. But okay. That's about as excited as they get. He's, she's going downhill means hurry up. So the snow was a little deep. She okay. knew that. She didn't want to get in it. Smart wolf. She had been darted before. Dutch it, dutch it. She was wearing a collar that didn't work. So we really wanted to target her. So this next sequence is when it's not very good. And actually, I'm trying to turn the gunning duties over to Dan. And I thought this, this is Hayden Valley a couple years ago. And I thought this was going to be ideal darting conditions. Deep snow. The wolves would get stuck in it. We just slide in next to them. Uh, so I said to Dan, I'm going to do this time. Well, I was completely wrong. The snow is like styrofoam. The wolves had maximum mobility. Look at this. This is juking and jiving. I did not shoot. You can't shoot at a wolf when it's turning. It's got to be lined out. Now this next wolf coming up is a pup. And pups are inexperienced, they don't know what to do. And she lined up perfectly straight. You can see the dart fly right in. Easy shot, it's a pup. She didn't know what to do. That other wolf was a big male. He was juking the jive. This is last winter in Hayden Valley. And this is a very difficult situation. The wolf was looking at me. And you cannot shoot at a wolf if it's looking at you can hit its face. Watch. It's also a new helicopter pilot, Bobby Hawkins of Grable, Wyoming, retired. So this is the first trip out with a brand new pilot. I wasn't sure how it's going to go. 